So, you know, I was thinking uh, just a little bit in that um, if you're, you know, next week starts, is Thanksgiving. So we, we start the Christmas shopping season as soon as we stop, start being thankful for what happened the last year. It's kind of mixed up, if, if you know what I mean, but, but that's okay. But in the light of that, if you were thinking of special gifts that, you know, you would want to give somebody, you always kind of want to plan ahead, you know. And I thought, you know, being as he isn't here, um, then we could, you know, I could just give you just a little over, override of what, what a guy like my son-in-law really needs. And um, one thing that, that he really doesn't need, by the way, he took, I think, about 100 discs because this, this disc golf course is all wrapped around water. I mean, if you miss, you're wet. And if you miss again, you're still wet, you know? And so I think he took like 100 discs. But if you were thinking about those special things, then I just want to let you know that uh, there are some things he probably really doesn't need. (laughs) Those those are leftovers. Those are the ones he gives his father-in-law to play with because, well, because I stink at disc golf. Um, so that may be, you know, something you kind of just wipe off the list. But, but I started thinking, I thought, well, you know, like Nate, Nate has uh, two boys, two girls, three girls, two girls, two girls, you know. Um, I have one young man. Well, he's an adult now. And then uh, three girls, you know, and stuff. So, but I thought Sean's kind of an odd guy in that, you know, he's got four daughters. So you got to ask yourself, say, so what? What would, you, what would you give a guy like that, you know? And uh, I think the perfect choice, I mean, there's a lot of things we could do, you know? But um, the Playmaker's tool set's probably not on it. Um, in fact, there's one person that, that we're very, very uh, familiar with that's actually been an astronaut. This person has run for president three times, okay? Never been married, and yet, you know, has been really kind of, has really kind of kept herself, in fact, uh, you know, as just a, an, a fashion icon. And her name is, uh, is Barbie. And I'm thinking, what, what could we get Sean? What, what would be that special song? Get, four daughters, come on. You know, he could just, he could just, I mean, wow, he could just play. And all these children, they love to sit there and put one pair of shoes on and put another, have another purse and all sorts of, oh, look at there. Now, coming from a guy that used to be a car dealer, by the way, yesterday was my last day. Can you, can you praise God with me? Yeah. For a guy that used to be a car dealer, I would say that is an accessory that every, every father of four would need, right? Because if, th- if there's four girls with four Barbies, well, you'd need, actually, you may want to go with the mini, the, the bigger, the extended van. So, um, so, so, but understand, there is all sorts of junk that you can give for Barbies. And, and, and it's really not about, you know, I always thought playing dolls would be about, hi, I'm Barbie, hi, I'm Barbie too. We must know each other, you know, and stuff. I, mean, I never really got it very much. My girls really didn't, well, my wife is Barbie. And so the kids really thought that would be disrespectful. She really will not like you to call her that. So anyway, so, but I thought, what do dads, what do they really do? You know, how do you play bar? I wouldn't have any idea. And the real, the real reality of it is that Barbie's all about accessorizing. You know, it's about, I got a purse and, 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 and I got shoes to match you know, that I've got, you know, there's, and all sorts, I mean, I this week just looked this up because I was so intrigued as I got on the internet, and all of the stuff you can buy for Barbies is just crazy, yeah. In fact, now, just so you know, because uh, there's some of you that are saying, you can't be perfect since 1959, and that's true, but now they're actually getting uh, Barbies, um, <laughs> that aren't necessarily shaped like 19-year-olds all the time, you know? I mean, like, different curves and different things. It's kind of crazy. Wow. Just crazy. So anyway, if you thought of that thing that maybe you want to get for Pastor Sean, you know, hey, think about it. You know, it's probably something you'd really appreciate. 
Well, today, I wanted to look at a passage of Scripture. It's in the book of Philippians, third chapter, and uh, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is a really interesting, interesting part of Scripture. Just to give you some background of Philippians, remember that these letters, when they're written, so they, were, they were letters written by Paul, and they were written... Um, from different places, but a lot of them were written in the, when he was in a Roman jail. And uh, I always think that, the, and, and each of them has a different flavor. Some of them are, are more corrective and stuff. And uh, this verse, this, uh, this book has both, has corrective things, and it also has things that are, uh, that are um, um, you know, that are encouraging and stuff like that. And uh, so we got to remember that Paul was a, uh, he planted the church at Philippi, and, uh, and then he, as so many ways, he, he continued to move on his uh, Macedonian call. He moved around and stuff. Then he got locked up in, 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 pr- in prison in Rome. And when he's writing, I think, that, I think one, of the, one of the coolest things about the, about the book of, of Philippians is, is Paul is writing it from a Roman jail, but I think the real... The real uh, subtext of the whole book is how to stay free. I mean, it really is. There's so much in there about, about freedom and about, uh, about things to avoid in order for our, for our lives with Christ to be significant. Who knows that um, just because, I mean, today you could, you could become a Christ follower and little by little, the Holy Spirit would move in your life and would take things away and would, would show you different things and stuff. But the reality is if we, don't choose, if we don't choose to walk in a redemptive lifestyle, then our, our, uh, the, the evidences of us walking in that lifestyle for this life will be less. You know, Jesus said, if, if you're forgiven, then what? You go and you forgive. You know, and those are those are just attitudes of the heart that God that God really gives us. But um, I mean, you can you if you tr- if you trust Christ today for your salvation, and if you go home and you don't make it, something happens or something. You are you are absolutely uh, assured to a spot in heaven because of the blood of Christ. Okay, but. Our problem is, I mean, I think of that thief on the cross. What, a, what, a, what an honorable position he got. He received Christ, and within a few hours, he was dead, and he was with him in paradise. He, he may have been one of the most envied guys, guys in the whole Bible because he didn't, have to, he didn't have to go out, and he didn't have to live life, and he didn't have to communicate with other people and, and stuff like that. He just he, he, he got saved, and then he, he, was, he was with uh, Jesus in paradise. He said, You'll be with me today in paradise. So, I mean, that's a good thing. But the problem is we all got to live. And so part of, the, part, of the live, part of the process is that we stay free. I can say, man, I forgive everybody. I, I just quit yesterday, like I say, my business. And I've got, I've got, some, I've got some debts that, um, that I'm struggling with what to do, you know? I don't want to... I mean, I was in business, and these are business debts that people owe me and stuff like that. But, I mean, you know, part of I don't even want to go there, but, but we're going to have, we're going to have these, people are going to step on your toes, Nate. Smash, you know. People are going to step on your toes and stuff. And things are going to happen. Everything's not going to be perfect. And so, if we walk in a redemptive mindset, then we will, then we will stay free. But if we continue to take on the burdens of other people's, of, of maybe where people have hurt us or, um, or, or wrong choices uh, based on, on, on our Christian life, there's a lot of things we can do to walk in limited freedom. God wants to be, he wants, he wants to be your provider. He wants, he, wants, he wants to walk life with you and provide for you. But as we walk through that, we find out the way for that really to happen is for for him to give him control of our finances. You, you see what I'm saying? There's all sorts of things that in the, in the, in the New Testament, grace runs rampant. It is, it is all about grace, okay? 
But understand this, that we can be free, okay? And, and God gives us, he gives us all sorts of clues on how to stay free. You know, to forgive others, to love others, to all these things. If all you've done is receive Christ, but, but yet we walk in unforgiveness and anxiety and stuff, we are walking in a limited um, reality of the freedom that Jesus came to give us. You got that? Does that make sense? Yeah. And so uh, I say all that to say Paul is, is writing this, and uh, he's writing to a church that he planted. He's kind of like a spiritual father to this church. So this is Philippians chapter 3. He says this. He says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Um, it's no trouble for me to write these same things to you. It's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision who serve God by his spirit and boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have a reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the, of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, based on the law, I was faultless. So, so we see here, if, if you look back in the second chapter of, uh, excuse me, of Philippians, you'll see that as Paul is ending the, the this is not, for, he didn't write this in chapters, okay? He wrote this as a continuing letter, okay? But right before this, we see that he is just a, encouraged them uh, to welcome his co-laborers, Timothy, who he exhorts very highly and just says, no one cares for you as much as Timothy does. And then he uh, talks about, uh, is it Epaphroditus, I think? And he says, you know, he says, he's, I'm going to send him to you and he can help you and stuff. And he's really, he's encouraging, uh, he's encouraging him and stuff like that. But then the, the chapter three takes over and he says, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And uh, he says, you know, and again, I say rejoice and all that sort of thing. So that's really cool. But then the, the whole mood of the thing, thing changes. You know, he says, watch out for those dogs. I mean, doesn't that seem weird? I mean, he's just really kind of la, la, la. It's like a Barbie life. You know, everything's going good, going good, going good. And then all of a sudden, he says, watch out for those dogs, those mutilers of the flesh, those men who do evil. Um, the, watch out for those people. Well, from, a, from study, we can understand what he's talking about is that there was Jewish uh, believers, people who were raised as Jews, even Pharisaical Jews, that received Christ and they became followers of Christ. And yet the Gentile believers in Philippi were not, they were Gentiles. And so these, these Judaizers come along and said, said oh, well, if you want to be like us, you got to be circumcised, you know? And so, and they're, and they're, they're pressing on these guys for circumcision. Um, you know, circumcision, you know, it's a cutting away of the flesh. I uh, never could understand exactly why it was so important, but I think we'll see the reality of that a little bit today. But, um, but these guys are putting pressure on these new believers. It's like if somebody received Christ and then somebody come up and said, well, you know, you've, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. I mean, if somebody receives Christ today, if it's your choice, if you've just made it a commitment to Christ, well, I want to tell you to, to, to consider putting the word of God in your life. Because the word of God, when it becomes fermented in our life, it changes our life, you know. And that stuff's important, but understand, we're all under grace, okay? And so, yet these Judaizers were coming and were saying that you got to be circumcised. And so, Paul, when he shifts gears here, he's talking about these mutilators of the flesh. And um, mutilators of the flesh and and uh, and and so on. He's mad. You know, if, if, if uh, I'm a father of four, and if, if you mess with my kids, you, you know, it's not a good thing. Right, dads? 
I mean, you know, I, I, they're the first people, uh, them and my family, are the first people that I'd go and, uh, and, uh, and to, to help. So, so Paul goes through that whole thing, and then he says, for it is we who are the circumcision. See, because, see, the, the, the followers of Christ were cut away from the Jewish, uh, the, the, those who followed the law, they were cut away from them. So when Paul says, we are the circumcision who worship God by the Spirit of God and put no confidence in the flesh. That, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about you and me, you know. But, but you know what? He's, he's just definitely uh, a little upset. And so, um, I mean, those are pretty strong words. And so, um, so I, I asked myself, I thought, what? Why is, why is he so strong in the language of that? Well, I've given you a clue already, but, but understand, Paul gives us, he gives us a, a, a hint of why he'd be that way. He says, if anybody thinks that they have righteousness, I the more. He said, I was, I was born the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee. I persecuted the church. I did all this stuff. Paul was faultless in regards to the law. He did all the stuff he was supposed to do. He said, he said, he said I have reason to do that, but, but, but we're the circumcision. We put no confidence in the flesh. And so he's, he's really combating against these Pharisaical believers that are trying to, trying to make uh, the reconcil- re- these two th- um, mindsets reconcile. And we know that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. What did he come to do? He came to fulfill the law. And it's because of the blood of Christ that we have fulfillment of the law. But, you know, we're looking at this from, from a historical point of, 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 a lot, of a lot of time later. We have so many uh, references in Scripture and stuff like that that we can, um, you know, that we can... Uh, um, look at, but so from Paul's perspective, from Paul's perspective, uh, we got to ask ourselves what he really knew. You know, see, in, in Genesis, the twelfth chapter, um, it says the Lord said to Abraham, uh, "This is what we call the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant." And he spoke to Abraham, and he said, "Go forth from your country." from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless those, and the ones who curses you, I will also curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Verse 45 says, Abraham went forth and did as the Lord spoke to him. We, we, we find it quoted in the, in the New Testament quite often, or several times. It says, and Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him as righteousness. And so it was at this point, the, it's really the first time in Scripture that, that God uh, really shows a, a thread of reconciliation. And if we follow that, that, that covenant of Abraham and follow it clear through the Old Testament, we'll see that we are grafted into that covenant, Okay. And so, anyway, but Paul knew this. This was, this was huge. And uh, so on. And Paul also knew that uh, for, for several generations, oh, um, oh, and in Genesis 17, that's where God brings up the thing about circumcision. And, and you, you could read it if you want, but I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit because I only got another hour to finish, so I better, you know, go pretty fast. Um, just kidding. Um, and so, um, so this time, he, but he talks, about, he talks about circumcision. And if you look at it in Genesis 17, you'll see that he is talking, he is, that circumcision in itself was not a righteous act. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. God, God says to him, he says, you should take everybody in your household and you should, all the males in your household, all the slaves and all the servants that you have in your household, and then you shall circumcise them and so on. And it says, and it will be a sign, it'll be a sign uh, of, it'll be a sign of, of the covenant. It is not the covenant. It was a sign of the covenant, okay? And so on. And so we know from history 
that uh, time goes on and uh, we get to the, where the children of Israel are wandering around in the desert and uh, uh, understand that, uh, you know, th- this is a nomadic lifestyle that they've got going on. And uh, as they're moving around, um, it's, it's pretty well thought of that circumcision really wasn't, wasn't really a part of, of this whole thing. Uh, because, I mean, just because of the, as, as babies were born and just different things, they're moving around. It, it just, it's, it really looks through scripture that it became very much not, not a real issue anymore. And um, Moses um, is married, and the Bible says one day that God came to kill Moses. Now, Moses was married to a a Midianite woman um, named Zipporah, and uh, and so on. And and Moses was like, he was like dying. And uh, she grabs a flint knife, and she goes... And, and circumcises his son and goes, and, and in the midst of a rebuke, she said, she said you're a, a husband of blood to me. And, and she, she's really fulfilling the law because she sees that Moses isn't, that the, the, uh, the covenant thing isn't working. You know, he's dying. God, for some reason, has, it says right in the scripture that God came and was killing Moses. And so she cuts away the foreskin of their, two, of their, of their, their children and, and takes and, and rubs it on his feet and says, you, you are a husband of blood to me. And it was just after that Moses got better. I, I don't know the whole story, uh, but uh, I can say that's what it says. It says, um, and so on. So, so I think Moses, uh, Zipporah, even his wife, um, was, a, you know, was a, some sort of a spiritual person. And she, she understood that and... Uh, and so she did that, and he got better and stuff. So then, uh, you know, but Paul would have known that. You know, he would have known that. Um, and then we get to the book, of, like in the book, and by the way, there's all sorts of stuff that we could write about super, uh, superstition, about circumcision. Um, but, um, but just to maybe talk a little bit, uh, book of Deuteronomy, verse 12 uh, is, a, is there's a shift here. And it says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and love him and serve him, uh, serve your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and statutes that I am commanding you today uh, for your good. Behold, the Lord your God, to, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens and the earth and all that's in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them. He chose their descendants after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Verse 16, so he says, circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. It's, it's the first time that we see that the, the shift in the word circumcision shifts. It shifts from the physical thing to the real, to I think the real issue, what uh, what uh, God wants to do, and then in uh, Deuteronomy uh, ten uh, verse six it says, "Moreover, the Lord your God, listen to this, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies." So that those who hate you, who persecuted you, and you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body, in the offspring of your cattle, and the produce of your ground. For the Lord again will rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commandments, his statues, were, which are written in the book of the law, if you turn to God with all your heart and soul, if you turn to God with all your heart and soul. He's talking again about circumcising, the circumcision of the heart. And so, you know, all of these scriptures uh, would have been fresh. In, in the, I, I don't think that we can even quite wrap our brain around what the mind of a Pharisee was about. 
But I mean, these guys went around, they studied and they studied, and they did everything they could do to get a full grip and a full grasp of, of this whole, of the law and all the things in it. So we have to understand that Paul knew, Paul knew this. And yet, as he, as he says this, he's so bold that I think there's still got to be something a little bit more. In the, in the book of Acts, chapter 7, there's um, an, an amazing, um, it's just an amazing um, um, defense of the gospel given by an amazing guy named Stephen. Stephen was a deacon in the church. Um, he was picked with some other guys to be those who would set tables or would, or you know, would would serve you know the food to the believers and stuff like that. And God pulled him aside and said, you know, find men that are full of the Holy Spirit. And they, and Stephen was one of these guys. And, and I think when it said he was full of the Holy Spirit, guys, I, I really don't think he's just talking about, was he there on Pentecost? You know? We all know that if you're, if, you're, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's a good thing. But if we're walking full of the Holy Spirit, that's a lot better, right? I mean, it's like, it's like you know, it's like no Monday mornings, period. You know, it's like, it's like the reality of Jesus in you. Jesus is in you. He came. He sent this Holy Spirit to be a part of you. But let's all understand that every day isn't a Barbie day. You know? There are days when, when we are filled and when we, when we really recognize um, when we're walking. You know what I mean? It's one of those days where we say, yeah, I, I know I'm walking with, the, with God. I'm walking full. I can sense his presence. And I can see that he's calling me to do stuff. And he's, he's, he's working in me, you know? And so when it says that he pick people that are full of the Holy Spirit, and they say Stephen is one of these guys, he's walking the walk. He is. And, uh, and so, if, I mean, and I, I believe Acts uh, 6 and 7, the story of Stephen, is just by far one of the most amazing things to ever meditate on and just go through it just to see all the amazing things. By the way, Stephen was no Pharisee. Stephen was, was a man whose heart was affected by Jesus. He was, he was just a normal guy like me and Larry. Larry's just a normal guy. You may think it. he's smarter than that. He is. Well, he is, but we're just normal guys, right? And yet he gives this huge defense. And it says that the, the law givers of that day looked intently at him. Well, when, somebody, when you feel like somebody's looking intently at you, that's, that's probably not a good sign. And neither was it here because they were, they were looking at him and they were, they were seeing they were seeing somebody that they greatly wanted to, to throw under the bus. And says so they looked at him, but when they looked at him intently, it said they saw the face of an angel. And I know by seeing people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, sometimes it bleeds out of their countenance and you can just see it. I believe that's what, I believe that's what Luke is saying in the book of Acts when he's talking about Stephen. It says that, it says that they could see in him the face of an angel. And as he gets done with this defense, at the end of his discourse, Acts 7, verse 51, he said, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts, you always resist the Holy Spirit just as your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers fail to persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you are his betrayers and murderers. You have received the law ordained by angels, but have not kept it. It says when his, when his accusers heard this, they were furious. And, and yet, Stephen, this is, a, this is maybe one of the coolest things in the Bible. But it, says, but it says, Stephen looked up to heaven and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And Jesus is looking down at him. you got to understand, Jesus, uh, God said to Jesus, come and sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies a footstool for, for your feet. And Jesus is on his tiptoes. 
He's standing at the right hand of God and he's looking down because of, because of this life that is so precious and is being walked out in such an amazing way. And says so Stephen saw him standing at the right hand of God. And then Stephen prayed this prayer. It says they drug him out of this town and they, they, uh, and they, they stoned him. It said they, they, um, they uh, took his clothes and they, they, they threw his clothes down and at the feet of a man named Saul. And then chapter 8 starts off with, and Saul gave approval to his stoning. Stephen was stoned, and, and, the, and the scripture says that he, even in the midst of, of being stoned, that he forgave his persecutor friend. That doesn't happen unless we're full, unless our hearts have been circumcised. It's just, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a game, you know. God wants to, you know, he's so much, you know, he gave circumcision, but then he, he hands it down and says, what I'm really looking for, I'm really looking for is circumcised hearts. And so we see this example of Stephen. And even in his death, he forgives. You see, what I think what Paul said was, is that, I think what Paul said was, is that he doesn't, that he, he wants the real thing to be the real thing. You know, the, the Pharisees came along and they said, okay, yeah, we know, we know about Jesus and everything, like that, but, but we, we really think, you know, that you need to, you need to, you need to, you know, have a little more of this. You need to have some, some of the law to go along with them. You need to have, uh, you need to understand what ceremonial washing is about. You need to know all these other things. And Paul is listening to this. And he said, no, that isn't the real thing. He says, I, he says, I, I, I have every reason to be righteous before God. And he says, I don't take that. In fact, I consider that loss for the, for the purpose of knowing Christ. But whatever was my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more? I consider it everything a loss to the surpassing of the greatness of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, whose forsake I have lost all things. In fact, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. See, Paul is saying these are all accessories that people are trying to throw in your life and there are all sorts of things that they're trying to add to and they're trying to make things uh, they're trying to they're trying to glamorize this whole story. They're trying to have their own their own corner of the market. And Paul says, "No, that's not what it's about. It's about Christ. It's not about accessorizing Him. It's about Christ." I mean, we need to remember that because you know what? There's a lot of hurt people out there on the street. There's a lot of people that have that have been raised in churches. They, you know, they've done stuff and so on. And a lot of people have been hurt. And you know what? There is nobody. I have not found anybody in all my travels that says, yeah, reason I don't go to, to church is because Jesus screwed me on that one deal. I can't say that, can I? No. <laughs> never. It's never happened. Jesus isn't the problem. The problem is, is his followers and how we accessorize the kingdom of God and we don't get first things first and we continue, we continue to put these other things ahead of him. It's just like Barbie dolls, guys. It's just about accessorizing. I think it's interesting scripture that says she wrapped him in swaddling clothes laid him in a manger all that other stuff just didn't matter 
let us be a people let us be a people Lord like Paul let us be a people I consider those rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know God. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, to become like him in his death, and to somehow, somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. You know, Jesus doesn't need to be accessorized. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the fairest of 10,000. Let's not be guilty. Let's be that, let's be that group of people. Let's be that congregation of people that when people when people see us in the midst of our difficult days and just different things like that that we still that they still see a godly countenance they still see uh, faces that show show the reality of Christ in us but that people Katie, but that people go away from our, our, our interactions. Say, you know what? I don't know where Katie goes to church. I don't know, you know. I don't know whether she's a sprinkled or, a, or an immersed, baptized. I don't know whether she dips her, her uh, communion in a cup and takes it or whether she does two parts. I don't know where she goes to church, but I know. I know that she has Jesus. That's the key. See, God was looking for a people whose heart would have been circumcised and went and went gone. God never, He never intended on the physical circumcision being the thing. He wanted a people whose hearts were circumcised before before Him. Could we be that people?